put some dots on the same body part on both sides. Mm -hmm. And then we can get a digital photo that takes the images and then looks at the lines and it creates your spine sort of as a optical wow. image. Yeah, thanks. So we'll do that first. There's a choking on the Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I would guess they would work with it. It'll go like this, just once or twice up and down with your feet, just a couple of times. And that's good. Shake out your arms and relax them. Okay? And you're going to have your eyes closed, you're going to look up once, look down once, and then come back up and breathe and you're looking straight and then open your eyes. Okay? And then you can be turned that way more by. So as I was mentioning before, when I get you to do your stuff with your eyes closed, that's how we see the health of the nervous system, right? So first test, I want you to put your feet totally together. Yep. So once you're down to your sides, don't do it yet. In a second, I'm going to make sure to close your eyes. When you close them, tell me if you feel stable or if you feel like your body kind of sways or goes in a certain direction. I already feel unstable. Already? <laughs> you said feet together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we, we, we narrow the base so that your body yeah. has to depend on the messing things. Okay, close your eyes. Yeah. What direction do you perceive it? Both. Like, I'm it's constantly, I'm, like, correcting. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, Okay. So, um, I'm going to be challenging the cerebellum. So, the cerebellum is yep. the thing that controls your balance, right? So, when it's healthy, if I push your shoulder, it should react to the contractor muscles to keep you upright. When it, it, so, the cerebellum controls your balance, but then how it connects into your brain, it balances, like, how you learn things, it can balance problem levels. Especially kids with learning challenges, the cerebellum mm -hmm. stimulates the prefrontal cortex and that gives them the awesome. So, to see if it's strong, I'm going to come behind you. You can keep your eyes open, but I'm just going to shove your shoulder. Okay. If it's strong, you should just react like, but if it's weak, you might go, eh, a little bit. I'll try not to anticipate it. <laughs> yeah, so just keep looking straight. I'll just randomly give you a shot in the shoulder. Okay, that was pretty good. Oh, so that's the one I was predicting. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. So when you close your eyes, you kind of went to that way first. Usually the side you go to as soon as you close your eyes is your weaker cerebellum. Okay. So they're kind of is it opposite or is it the right side? Like yeah, this, this one's weak, but you would fall on that side. And when I challenge you this way, you would fall that way. Okay. Uh, you can open your feet now. <clears throat> so eyes, um, eyes can be closed. So I want you to bring your arms forward parallel to the ground like that. Eyes closed? Eyes closed and then bring them up. So keep them where they are, open your eyes. So at this time, I'm just looking to see if they come up to the same level. Sometimes people have to have you know, challenges like that. Sometimes it's just mm -hmm. posture. The other thing I'm looking for is the tip of the fingers to see if I'm ever seeing tremors. Because when people's brains are starting to get weak, sometimes tremors will start to show up. Alzheimer's and dementia, we have, we can find that stuff 30, it have, it's starting to happen 30 years before people can really, you know, have like, actually experience it, right? So now next one here, your fingers are going to be pointing like this. I'm going to say right or left, whichever one I say, with your eyes closed, slowly you got to turn your finger like this and come into the tip of your nose. Okay. So when you do it, don't go like that, because that's not accurate, and then you're coming straight. Okay. Okay, so the parietal lobe of your brain kind of starts to find stuff, and then the cerebellum fine-tunes the movement when you get closer to a target, mm -hmm. so that way I can see how the fine-tuning is in your system. Awesome. Okay. So eyes closed. <clears throat> so I do the right one first. That was excellent. Okay, go back. Now don't poke out your eye and do the left one. <laughs> <laughs> You're already predicting something. <laughs> no, you did good. It was a little up, but yeah. not too bad. It was just up by about a half a centimeter. Okay. So it's the, the first one is the important one because you start to self-correct after that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. So hands down. Now I just want to see how you walk. So you're just going to walk normally like you normally would straight towards me. Turn, go back about four or five times. <clears throat> Can you roll up your pant leg or test your ankles? No, I actually roll them up because I want to see you. are just going to walk on your heels towards me. Your toes up here like that. Okay, that's good. Turn and go back on your tippy toes. Okay, that's pretty good. Alright, so now this is the most challenging neurological test. We call this the drunk driver test almost, but it's a little bit different. So you're looking straight, your eyes yeah. are closed, and you actually have to touch your heel and your toe together. And you physically have to touch when you do it. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's tough. It's mental. 
mental workout. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Just gonna put this behind you there. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the last test we do in the room here. We call this one the wild test. Okay. So it's pretty simple. Your arms are down at your sides. Normally we do this one with the arms folded, but I just do it down. It's fine. Your eyes are going to be closed, and you're just going to march on the spot like this, about this high and about this fast. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be for one minute. It'll seem like a long time in silence. Just keep going until I tell you to stop. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? I'm watching the clock, but I said three, two, one, and go. We didn't even get to a minute. That's fine. So it was about 40 seconds. So stay there. I was wondering what you were doing. I thought you. Three, four, five. So you're going to say that would have been about six. Wow. So that's, see, it's the wild test. That's why we call it the wild that's test. That's crazy, yeah. Okay, so that's about 30 degrees to the right. Four degrees, three degrees. That's an incredible. I was wondering why you were. So we have like, you know, all the sensory information coming into the spine and into the brain and yeah. also your vestibular system which can do your position sense. And normally, you know, within like half a foot of where you start would be kind of normal. <laughs> yeah. Right? But going that way, there's actually a challenge in the system and perceiving where your body is in space is usually kind of overcompensates in the direction it's never feeling itself. And that kind of thing. So there's no, yeah, because you're taking away the sense of... Uh, sight and, and sight and sight yeah. just on a flat surface and then so you know it's depending on what's coming in through this muscular through the through the joint receptor system feedback is just so confused the brain and then the neck so if there's disturbances in the spine from the subluxations the messages can be garbled and then this can kind of that's the output <laughs> that's yeah. amazing yeah yeah okay so now we're just going to go for some reflex muscle testing mm -hmm. okay so I'm going to get you to take a position, I'm going to push and hold the position. So that's your first one there, hold strong. Good. Bring your arms down like this, lift them up like that, and then hold there, strong. Good. Go straight with your fingers, don't let me push them down. Good. Curve them halfway, don't let me open. Open them like that, and don't let me close them. Good. Relax, bring your feet, <coughs> bring the bottom towards As fast as you can go, go up and down like that really quick on the same spot. Bring them straight ahead of you like this, curve them like you're doing the radio knobs and spit really fast. Just quick, quick, quick. Okay, so there's a little crap in there. Yeah, it's from the left side. <laughs> yeah, so it's the cerebellum thing again. I feel like I'm absolutely useless in some things. It just, might... just doesn't, doesn't yeah. fit in. The whole left side probably just shut down. <clears throat> so last we're going to, this is a, we call this like an integration test. So doing rapid and alternating things kind of like this is cerebellum. But then we're going to integrate it to see if the upper part of your brain can connect with it. Okay. So it's more of a complex movement. So your hands are going to be here. You're going to bring them both out at the same time. Mm -hmm. Each time you bring them out, you're switching the hand that you open at the end. Okay. There's usually a learning curve for this. Most people don't need to take 15, 20, 20 minutes to get it. So just keep going. So both hands go out, bow and hold. That's right. <laughs> okay. Not too bad. So for five or six, you actually have that. Okay. Most people take. Can this uh, affect your thinking? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's how I feel. I feel like. I'm very um, uh, hard to keep tr stay focused on one thing. Right. That's probably one of the biggest things. Like I'll be doing something, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stay focused on this. I'm gonna do something. Pops up on my computer screen. Yeah, and I'm like, oh man, I was gonna do. I'll even write things down that I want to get accomplished at the end. Just don't do it. Just don't do it, right? <laughs> like it's just for, like I feel like I'm not as focused as I should be. Right. So you know, like, uh, like I said, we work on a lot of times with ADHD kids and that kind yeah. of stuff too. And uh, there, there's some, some neurons in the brain that um, when we're little babies, if let's say, you know, go back to old hunter gatherers, they put a baby down in a cave or something like that, and a predator comes, they'll always look at it and cry because they can't move or get away from it. 
and usually when your brain development goes well and your brain gets healthier, that, that reflex kind of goes away. But a lot of kids with ADHD are difficulty focusing, that kind of stays. So when they're in the classroom and somebody moves, they're always looking, they're always, they can't stay focused because whatever yeah. happens around here, they always have to look at it. Yeah. Like they just don't, the reflex is there and they can't get over it, sort of thing. Right? So it's an inherent, like you, it's an instinct almost. In a yeah, sense. There's, we call them primitive reflexes, and sometimes there's certain parts of the brain that will have those that will continue to have them if your brain doesn't develop as healthy as a kid. Sometimes. Uh. And, and so a lot of times, kids that have challenges in the autism spectrum and stuff, they'll have these reflexes that they that should have gone away when they were like one and a half, one, one and a half years old, mm -hmm. but they actually persist. And so that'll change how they walk, it'll change how they feel in their body, it'll prevent them from doing certain things and continue to have bedwetting because these reflexes are still there, they should have gone away. Gotcha. And so when I do my work, we, we make sure we get rid of those reflexes as they all the their brain. Because the brain usually gets hung up on that, that part, yeah. it doesn't go past like one and a half or two years old, so they still have these primitive areas of the brain that are still not doing the, the work that they need to, hmm. and it hangs up their development. Gotcha. Okay, so that's kind of cool. cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. First time I heard anything like that. All right. So, so we're going to test on the whiteboard here. We call this block blind spot mapping. Mm -hmm. And sort of like the, the broad overview is that you, a light hits your eye, the light has receptors in it, and through the nerve in the back of your eye goes back to your brain. So mm -hmm. you actually see with your brain, you don't see with your eyes, you don't hear with your ears. They just send the signal and your brain picks it up. Yeah. So what happens is your, your brain is actually stimulated when you move your joints. Okay, so if this room was totally pitch black, I know exactly how many fingers they are and you totally know where your body is mm -hmm. through those little signals that come from your joint movement. It comes up to your brain, so your brain is actually stimulated and kept healthy when your body moves. Gotcha. So 10% of the stimulation comes from your arm and leg joints, 90% comes from your spinal bone movement. Okay, so it's important that all the bones in your back move freely. So when you have these subluxations, the bones that are stuck, yeah. you're getting less stimulation coming up to the brain. They can be more stuck on one side, so one half of your brain can get less stimulation than the other. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the light hits your eye, goes back to the brain. So where that nerve comes out of the back of your eye, there's a little hole there, and there's no retina. So that causes all of us to have a little blind spot over here. So we don't notice it because that's not where we're looking, it's off to the side. Yeah. So measuring that will tell me how, how healthy the brain is from stimulation coming up from your body. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it on the board here. <clears throat> so what's going to happen is you're going to bring your toes up to the edge of the paper like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to cover one eye and you're going to stare at the blue dot over here somewhere as your blind spot. This was somebody else's today. So yeah. they didn't see anything in that. So to see how big that is, you take this little paper clip here, so yeah. the blue tip on the end. Yeah. I'm going to put it beside it and I'm going to start moving it like that. So you're not following that with your eye, you're always looking straight at that one, but you're paying attention to the tip of that thing. Perfect. And what will okay. happen is you'll see my hand, you'll see the yellow paper clip, it's just that the tip will just disappear for a second, and then it'll reappear. Hmm. So you tell me when it goes away, and then when it comes back, and then it'll go back where it disappeared, and then you say, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it, and then I can drop the borders of the blind spot. Okay? Very cool. So you can see both of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't follow it, but tell me the second mm -hmm. the blue tip disappears. No. When does it come back? No. Okay, if I put it here, you should not see it, correct? No. Say now when it comes back. No. Okay, when does it come back? Now. When does it come back? Yeah, okay, it's pretty good. So we have it on. Relax for a second. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, that's fine. You can relax for a That one's much bigger. Uh -huh. Bigger blind spot. We would like to have a balanced brain, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It would be nice. Between yeah, yeah. Sides. there's a we actually have a word for it. we call it a hemisphericity, which is the, the functional neurology term for. It. I even had a hard time finding when it left. Yeah, like exactly. It, or, or coming back in, I was like, oh, I don't know, is that sure. it or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's almost haziness on the border. Yeah. Too. So when your brain is healthy, it's very clear. It's yes. Like I can see it, I can't see it. But when it's weak on that side, there's like the fuzzy margins and stuff, right? So, yeah. Huh. All right.
Yes. So here's the spine. If I take pull it two bones of the back, yeah. those are the bones you see when you bend forward. Mm -hmm. So what's that yellow thing there? Spine. Spine on the cord. Spinal cord, there right? you go. So you got the brain up here, it's sending billions of nerves down this big cable, and as it's going down, these little branches come off between the bones. And those are the nerves that will go out to control your body parts. So if your spine is healthy, ideally all the bones will be more or less lined up and they should all move freely. Okay? So that's called healthy. So we say that when your brain is sending electricity down your nerves, that will coordinate, regulate, and all your tissue should heal, function, and perform 100%. Yeah. So the word subluxation means you have a physical stress, a chemical stress, or an emotional stress that overwhelms your body and you can't adapt to it, mm -hmm. and it blows a, blows a fuse in the back. Okay, so the spine will get either stuck in that area, doesn't move properly, it might get a little bit out of place, and it'll actually start to disturb the nerves. So from that point on, whatever that's controlling can heal, function, or perform at 100%. It's kind yeah. of working, but it's not. It's good yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right? So I'm going to check your spine, look for these, and so when I find one, I'll actually say out loud the level that I'm finding it, and then you can look across and see what kind of problems that can cause in the body. It doesn't mean you have all of those at that level, but those are <coughs> potential problems that with stress and nerves at those different levels. Okay. Okay. So I just show that that feels like you. Could you give me a hand here for a sec? Yeah. So <clears throat> if I push on bones in your back, if they're healthy, they should be springy like that is. Let's mm -hmm. get some give to it. Now make a fist. That's what it feels like when you push on a subluxated one. Okay. You give into joint. Okay. Yeah. So is it because the muscles are tight well, around it, or? It's always the nerves controlling the muscles, okay. and the muscles will get contracted and pull it out or pull yeah. it tight like that. That's correct. Sometimes it can be even scar tissue and things like that. Mm -hmm. well. So try to lift up a little bit there. Leave your body's loose and you can relax. That's good. So we're just going to start right up at the top. Okay. So when I challenge this side, it's not too bad. That one that has forward motion here, that one there doesn't. So this is the C2 on the right. Mm -hmm. So these nerves come up into the head. Sometimes people get headaches from that. That also controls the air balance and things like that. Sometimes people get ringing in the ears and get sinus problems from this as well. Memory trouble, that's what I yeah. <laughs> That's right, focus too. <laughs> A lot yeah. of kids with ADHD and autism spectrum that almost always there's something right up at the very top and that affects you know, the cerebellum stimulating the front mm -hmm. parts of your brain. So this is the second one in your upper thoracic, so that would be controlling your bronchioles and your heart. Right, so I'm going to lay on your stomach, your head there, and it's a little bit more tension on the left hip compared to the right hip. Just going to go up through the erectors on both sides here. Tender. All right, so I see, can you feel that right there? Yeah. Okay, so that sort of was like a really knotty guitar string sort of thing. Yeah. Like wound up tight. So usually when I say that when that isn't moving, these erectors take up the slack or try to try to make it move and they get hyperactive and hyper they actually hypertrophy, so it's physically bigger on this. Sit up for me? Yeah. Take off your shirts and everything and show us the, the goods. That's right. We <laughs> did a photo shoot last week just for like yeah, so you guys fitness and yeah, fitness yeah. stuff. So yeah. You Hopefully they don't fall out of shape too bad already. That's right, that's right. The post structure back. So it yes. talks about three main parts of your central nervous system. Right? Okay. So we have billions of nerves all over our body, but they do different things. They have different roles. So that circular thing is kind of like a pie chart of our nerve system. Okay. Right? So the pink part, sensory nerves, are what you can sense or perceive yourself. So yeah. what you feel. So that gives you a sense of hot and cold and pain and touch. That's about 10% of those billions of nerves. The other 90% of your nerve system, you actually don't feel how it works. Okay. So you need to measure it. Okay, so that's why somebody can feel good today playing golf and then die of a heart attack tomorrow. If you ask him today how he's doing, I'm great, I feel awesome, and then he dies of a heart attack. So he really wasn't healthy the day before, but he felt okay. Because uh -huh. if it's not touching the sensory nerve and giving you a sensation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Positive, right? Yeah. So I stuff with good health doesn't mean you feel good, it means you function good. Right? Okay. So that's why we do these functional tests to see gotcha. is it functioning or dysfunctioning, right? So the, the parts of the nerve system here, we have two things that measure that. So we have muscles that I can consciously control, like I want to move my arm, but then the ones that control our postural muscles, like the cerebellum and that, that postural control, we don't have, we, it's not consciously controlling that, like you can't move the, the fourth vertebrae to the left between your shoulder blades, you can't think about doing yeah, that. Yeah, consciously you can't do it. So and these measure those muscles, right? So the, it's called surface electromyography, so I'm just going to place it on your skin, and what it does is it takes a reading of how tight the muscles are on both sides of the spine all the way down, and we get a read out of where you're holding more attention, how much it is compared to norms and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And 
this thing here, this is called rolling the thermography. So there's a thermometer there and a thermometer in there. We're just going to roll that up your spine. So what this is measuring is the nerves. Some of them go, go back and control your muscles, and some of them go forward to control your organs inside your body. And those nerves also control the blood flow in your skin. So if there's a disturbance from the subluxation, that will usually cause a constriction. It'll get colder on that side. And wherever that break in the temperature is, we know what organ is controlled at that level. So we can see how your spine health is affecting your organ health on the inside. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's where we, we see these breaks in the temperature when we do this. Okay. Yeah, this might be a little cold as we get started here. Begin scan S1. Okay, so we're just taking a reading of the bilateral temperature as I roll this up. Landmark specific area so that each time we do it, we know where we are and it knows where your spine is. Left C1. Right C1. C1. Okay, so this one's going to be eight times colder than that one was. That's okay. okay. So yeah. let's keep looking straight again. So there actually is some curvature in the spine. So um, the midline of your sacrum is here. Mm -hmm. It's coming up this way. And then right around here, it's actually curving off to the right side and kind of recompensating and coming back again. So just looking at your rib cage, this is more straight. This has a bit of an indentation in it. So your rib cage is actually following the curve of your spine a little bit. Okay. And then definitely this side is fairly flat, but there's a lot of erector development on this side. It's actually more pronounced all the way down this side, like that. So sometimes as the spine is curved, it rotates a bit, and it, it, these it kind of get pulled with it too. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I've noticed that my, like this abdominal development, yep. or oblique, is like so far less than the right side. Uh -huh. As you can, and just slowly try to bend, bend your spine by curving it, let it curve forward like you're going to touch your toes. Okay. Go ahead and do that. So look straight now, and we're just going to bring this arm, let it slide down this side here. So it's curving pretty good here, and then I'm almost moving. Really? Yeah. So that, that could have actually come from how you were born. If you, if you find anything, you were born with like a C section, four steps, or something. I was. Yeah, C section? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty common that they kind of yank on the head, and that can cause like most 90 percent of kids will have a subluxation in the neck right after they're born anyway. Really? Sometimes it could be more traumatic depending on how you're born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can the C-section can actually react to contractions on one side that never lets go and then the spine has to kind of move around to keep your eyes level as best it can and it kind of shifts wow. your body out of place. I think that's probably why. Yeah, yeah it's possible. Alright, so this is the last of the three-dimensional objective analysis thing we do. So okay. we call it the pulse wave profiler. And what it's actually looking at is something called heart rate variability testing. You've heard of that? Maybe? No. I have. Okay. So basically, we can, kind of came out of Russian athletes, and they were testing them everything. And they found that what happens is your, your heart's supposed to beat, but it shouldn't beat at exactly the same time because it needs to give the muscles a rest. So even like a you know, millisecond of difference is giving it a break. Because okay. if it beat at exactly the same time, it would poke a hole in one of the atrials. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, what it does is we find that um, that system is controlled by your autonomic nerve system. Mm -hmm. So we have the conscious system, like I want to move my arms, yeah. but then the autonomic one controls your heart rate, your blood pressure, your hormones, your breathing. Sympathetic parasympathetic. So, sympathetic and parasympathetic, right. So what happens is when people have a healthy autonomic system, their heart rate should vary. So when you breathe in, it's supposed to speed up. When you breathe in, it slows down. So it should actually have variations. Mm -hmm. And the more fluctuation and variation it has, that means it's much more flexible and adaptable to stresses. If you're like running at as much as you can, there's very little adaptability in your heart's beat. You do it and it's very, very consistent, but it doesn't have a lot of flexibility at that point. Okay. So when people are getting sick and their nervous system isn't healthy, they lose that adaptability and that variation goes down. Okay. okay. So that's what this is going to measure. Okay, so what this is going to do, it's going to take a five-minute reading of your heart rate and a couple of other parameters, 
and from this reading, it'll do a, kind of put it through an algorithm and put a dot on this chart. So this chart actually represents your autonomic nervous system. So this side is the parasympathetic, or sorry, this is the sympathetic fight, mm -hmm. or fight or flight side. That's the yeah. parasympathetic rest and digest side. Okay. So they tell people that that system works like a teeter totter all day. Yeah. So if you have to run for the bus, it will speed up your heart rate, speed up your breathing. Yeah. And then when you catch the bus, it puts the brake on, and then it comes back to center again. Gotcha. Right? Okay. So it's doing this all day. So if you have your hand in the machine for five minutes and you're not doing anything, we just like it to be in the middle. Right. So the dot we'd like it to be on the midline. Okay. We'll the dot shows up. Okay. And then the height of the dot is a representation of your body's reserves. How much capacity you have to handle more stress in the future, your adaptive capabilities. Okay, good. good to know. So I, I always tell people this is just the car analogy. You know, you don't want to be stuck on the gas pedal. You yeah, don't want to be driving the red. <laughs> and you want to have a full tank of gas, right? So that's how you can think of that. So I did it on myself one day and I was just on the low end here. And then I ran on the spot really fast for like a minute, as fast as I could, and put my hand back in and the dot came all the way over there. When Pure sympathetic. It, yeah. When I rejected, it, right? So that's that's correct for somebody who just ran really hard, but if you're sitting here not doing anything and it already shows up there. Only for three green lights, so it's going to check your heart rate, your skin conductance, and your skin temperature. When it has a good reading of all of them, you'll get three green lights and then we'll start it. So what it'll do, it'll, it'll give you a one minute of rest. So it's not recording, it's just kind of chilling out, giving you a minute to kind of acclimate and then leave the room so you can just be relaxed. Yeah. And then after that, it'll start the reading. So that's the exam. Cool. <laughs> Very difficult. All right.